Today we're going to look at the chi-square goodness of fit test. It's one of the few stats tests I still do by hand. Here's the formula. We're going to break down these parts so it's not so scary, but first I want to tell you when and why you should use chi-square. So chi-square is when you're taking two or more nominal variables and their counts and comparing those counts, those numbers, to a theoretical expectation. So that could be something like a 3 to 1 phenotype ratio. In chi-square, your null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference between your observed values and expected values. Your alternative hypothesis is that your observations are different from expected. So what's always weird to students is that you normally want to reject the null hypothesis, right? You're seeking some difference. But in genetics, failing to reject the null is more often the goal. It means the pattern of inheritance you predicted is a good fit. So let's break this formula down. This symbol just means sum. It means calculate the following for all your groups and add them up. So the O here is your observed count and the expected count is E. When I'm doing this, I like to set up a chart. It helps me prevent math errors, and I can set up these formulas in a spreadsheet with a similar chart, and it will do all the calculations for me, like if I don't want to add all these numbers by hand, but I still want to have some control over what I'm doing. So let's make sure we can do it by hand in hopes that you start to develop the idea you know, the ability to kind of look at these things and make some inferences and kind of be able to judge what should be the result, you know, because you've had some practice and you've seen what numbers look like when they're close enough to be a good fit or not. Now let's try this out with some of Gregor Mendel's original pea plant data. So believe it or not, when he was counting these peas, he counted 7,324 pea seeds. Of those, we have these numbers for round and wrinkled, and we know that with a cross of two heterozygous individuals, we're expecting three-fourths dominant and one-fourth to be recessive. So we can multiply 7,324 by 3 fourths and by 1 fourth and get our expected values. Now I subtract O minus E, so you can see that already popped up, and I multiply that value by itself. Then I divide by E to come up with my two values here at the end, and two categories means that I take these two variables variable values, sorry, I take these two values and I add them at the end to arrive at my chi-square value. This value is my test statistic, the chi-square value, and I need to compare it to a critical value to know if I can reject my null hypothesis. For that, I need to know the degrees of freedom. So to get the critical value, I need the degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is normally related to some number minus one. Like if a string of operations needs to add up to a certain number at the end, I have the freedom to choose all but one of the numbers. That's how I remember it. Often, degrees of freedom take sample size into account, but since E already factors in how many samples were counted, in chi-square, we look at the number of groups minus one. So our degrees of freedom here, for round and wrinkled, two groups is one. Looking at a critical value chart for chi-square, that 0.05 is still our default threshold for statistical significance. And if we look at degrees of freedom of one, we can find where they cross is kind of our magic number for our critical value, that is 3.841. Zero point two six is definitely less than three point eight four one. You really could look at the observed and the expected values and see that they were kind of freakishly similar. And so in this case, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We see a good fit in our observed and expected values. Now I want you to try this one out on paper before you play the rest of the video. So looking at another trait, 
705 purple flowers, 224 pea plants with white flowers. And we still have a three to one phenotype ratio expectation. So go ahead and pause here and try and figure this out. Okay, so the first thing we need is a total. That's 929 and some expected ratio to multiply by or a fraction to multiply by. When we do that, we get our expected values, subtract O minus E, multiply that by itself. When you only have two variables, you're gonna see that these numbers match, um, but just don't expect that to happen when you have more than two variables, just giving you a heads up. And divide that by E. Again, these numbers are very, very similar. In fact, a lot of people thought Gregor Mendel might have fabricated these numbers because they are all so, so similar um, to the expected values. Um, it is likely, you know, I can't, I don't know, but um, he did count a lot of pea plants and that does allow you to approach um, you know that expected ratio take these numbers add them up it's a very small number that number is less than 3.841 and so think about it maybe pause is it a good fit do we fail to reject yes it is a good fit and we fail to reject all right, one more time. Finally, let's try a dihybrid cross, right? So let's look at four nominal variables at once. So here are our yellow, green, and round wrinkled dihybrid cross results that Gregor Mendel found. I want you to go ahead and pause again. Try to work it out to a chi-square value and a decision about the null hypothesis and the fit. All right, so we get our total. We multiply now by nine over 16, three over 16, and one over 16. So you will see that, you know, since it's a nine to three to three to one ratio, you do see 104.25 twice. Um, you should see that. And I'm using decimals, even though I know I can't have a, you know, quarter of a P, I can expect a quarter of a P. It is okay to do that. You don't have to round to the whole P number, okay? And I work the rest of that out so you can check your math. Again, observed and expected logically, like intuitively, look pretty similar. And when that is the case, you know, if there's no math errors, so this is a good way to check for your math. If intuitively those numbers are very similar, you should see a very small chi-square value. And again, with a different degrees of freedom, three degrees of freedom here, you'll see that our critical value changed to 7.815. But just like before, since our test statistic is less than our critical value, it's a good fit and we fail to reject the null. So I hope this helps you feel a lot more confident about working chi-square problems by hand, especially with the table. It is just so, so easy. But sometimes when things are easy, it's also easy to make those simple math errors. So take your time, you know, again, apply your logical inferences. Don't just trust whatever number pops out of your calculator. Um, you know, think about it too and you'll do fine.